Hello and welcome everyone to the Cybers Focus Forum webinar series. Good to have you all back. I'm Tina Lee, Cybers' User Engagement Officer. Today's webinar is titled Hit the Ground Running with SNP Calling for Pop Gen and Evolutionary Analysis, presented by Jacob Landis. For those of you who are new to Cybers, and there looks like there's a good many of you who may not have been to a webinar before that we've given, we are a cyber infrastructure project funded by the United States National Science Foundation. And this free webinar series helps fulfill a key part of our mission, which is to train scientists on how to use Cybers' computational resources. So I'm gonna take care of some quick housekeeping before Jacob starts. Uh, today's presentation is approximately 30 minutes. Be sure to mute your audio and stop your sharing any video, but please do enable the chat window and you can type any questions you have there. Jacob will answer these after his presentation where we'll have time for lots of questions and answers. Um, we are recording the video and later on today, other materials and the video recording will be posted um, on our website. And we also have a YouTube channel that you can subscribe to, to watch this video at any time. In addition to these webinars, Cyvers is virtualizing most of our training events as well as all of our online learning materials. So please visit our website learning pages for more information. And now I am pleased to introduce Jacob Landis. Jacob is currently a lecturer for plant systematics at Cornell and a research associate in the SPECT lab there. He also works closely with Susie Strickler and her group at the Boyce Thompson Institute's Computational Biology Center. His research interests lie primarily at the intersection of evolutionary genomics phylogenomics and population genomics. Many of the projects in the SPEC lab have started using Oxford nanopore sequencing for both DNA and RNA, for which Jacob has been instrumental in optimizing for a variety of monocot species. Um, Jacob has kindly responded to our request for a webinar on SNP calling, and so welcome, Jacob. Thank you, Tina. Thank you all for coming today, and thank you for all the folks at Cyverse to help make this possible. And so when I think of SNP analyses, these are some of the things I think about. So a coalescent tree analyses to look at evolutionary relationships, structure or admixture analyses, uh, genome-wide association studies, and principal component analyses. However, these are the goals, but to get there it takes a lot of work. And that that getting up to that point is what we're, what we're going to be talking over today. And so the things I hope to provide in this webinar is just an overview of different approaches for SNP calling, enough background on methods, and then some scripts to get you started on your journey. I am gearing this towards folks who may not know how to do SNP calling ahead of time, but who are, who are comfortable with the command line. Um, if this is not you though, it is okay. We will provide some options in the discovery environment on Cybers. However, those resources are quite limited. So they'll work on the small data set, but they may not work on bigger projects. And so um, I'm also going to hopefully provide a few tips and tricks to speed up the learning curve for some of these analyses and also provide an example data set um, and, and scripts to try out different methods um, with Cyverse and, or on your uh, local machines. So before we get started, what is SNP analysis? So at its most simple, at the simplest form, it is a single nucleotide polymorphism shown here. So here's three strands of DNA, and in one base position, we see an A, G, or T. So the differences between these different individuals or species, uh, whatever they may be. Why is this important? Uh, SNPs are the most common genetic variation uh, in the genome, and they can be linked to phenotype, environment, or heredity. So the basic workflow is that you have your uh, sequencing files from all of your accessions in FASTQ format, or uh, a gzip fastq, you either align or assemble those uh, so that way you're comparing the same uh, genomic regions, you find variants, and then you filter. And then you can move on to downstream analysis, which we will not cover in this webinar. So there are many options for uh, generating SNPs, and there's many factors that go into deciding what is the most appropriate option for you. Some of the main, um, the main options are genome skimming or resequencing, RADSeq using reduced representation sequencing, either uh, a double digest or a single digest, RNA-seq or HYBE-seq or uh, hybridization-seq or exome capture all kind of fit in that same bottom category. 
And there's different levels of investments in terms of what lab and bioinformatics um, that need to be there for these different approaches. So this table, which was modified from a study of last year, which was focused on phylogenomic analyses. However, it is quite relevant for SNP analyses. Some of these you do require uh, genomic resources ahead of time. Some it's helpful, but not necessarily required. The different levels of initial and ultimate bioinformatic investment do differ between these, as well as the laboratory cost. And then finally, the ultimate cost per sample are all very important things to, to consider. Um, some additional topics that I'm not covering that may drive your choice if you haven't generated data yet are the size of the genome, the number of individuals you hope to study, uh, how much of the genome do you need uh, to sequence to answer your particular interest, and what is the ultimate goal, goal for all these analyses. And so first, we're going we're gonna to jump into first uh, RADSeq using a de novo approach. And so uh, this can be done with uh, DNA extractions using uh, basic CTAB or other similar extraction methods, depending on what is best optimized for your system. Uh, when it comes to uh, restriction enzymes that cut the genome, there are many different options with different uh, cut sites and frequencies. This works really well for recently uh, sampled silica dried material, at least if you work on plants, if you work on other, um, other systems. Um, relatively uh, recent uh, collection. They do not have to be completely fresh or flash frozen, frozen but something that's stored recently. Uh, herbarium samples or museum samples uh, can also work. However, a study from a few years ago uh, looked at the change over time and for RADSeq in terms of quality, quality of the reads and also missingness of the data. So since years of collection, the longer the collections ago were made, the, the, the uh, less the lower the quality of the reads becomes. And conversely, the older the samples, the more missing sites you may have in your data set. And so some of the most common uh, packages to analyze this sort of data are IPIRAD or Stacks. Uh, I've used Stacks in quite a few projects recently, and that's one that we're gonna be talking a little bit more about today for this part of the webinar. And so here's the basic outline uh, workflow for Stacks. So within the Stacks uh, program, there is a Perl, a Perl script, this de novo map uh, Perl wrapper uh, that will run through this entire pipeline for you. All you need to do is specify where your FASTQ files are and what the population map is. And so just briefly, the different parts are the U stacks, the C stacks, and the S stacks. So the U stacks assembles loci in each individual and then allows you to specify the number of nucleotide differences uh, that you want to include to define what a locus actually is. Then it assembles a catalog of all these loci and then matches each of your samples uh, to catalog them for SNP calling. And if you want to know more about that, please check out the Stacks uh, manual, which is very detailed. And so the input for this is really just one line of code if you're doing this on the command line. So I'm going to represent a lot of the code in this, in this webinar this way um, with boxes around it. And so the format of this, this command is basically you are calling the program, and in particular, this uh, de novo map uh, Pro wrapper. So the exact location may be different depending on how you install this on your machine. The input files you need, again, are just a, a path or a folder to where your FASTQ files are located, and then a, popu a population map and where that population map is. You'll also, um, denote a output directory. In this case, it's just the Novo wrapper. And then you can have additional out options. Here, I'm just uh, specifying additional threads. If I was running this on a server, if you're running on your local machine, um, that may be uh, a dash T equals to two. There are some examples of how different population maps that you can actually use in this. So according to the, um, the user manual, they suggest one like this, where a priori, you can uh, identify what population the different individuals come from. Now, so if you were, um, have different samples from say different cities or different places, you can easily do this. Another option though is to specify so that each of your individuals is essentially a population. The SNP calling doesn't really change um, between these two methods. However, the output files that you generate uh, will be a little bit different. And again, depending on what your question and your downstream analyses are, uh, it might be relevant to do uh, in either case or both cases. Uh, the one thing I will mention, there is additional script that I am not including in this uh, or command, and it's from the populations command of, uh, of the de novo pipeline, where it will actually output the BCF file for you. If you follow along on the GitHub page and the tutorial there, that is, that is included. 
Um, but also that's also very clear on the user manual. And so the second uh, option now is doing a reference-based RADSEQ approach, um, again, using stacks uh, as well. So for this, the wet lab preparation is exactly the same as for the de novo approach. Um, nothing changes in how you generate the data. However, you do need to have some form of reference genome to map the reads to. I'll talk a little bit more about the quality that may be necessary. Using this reference approach uh, can, make, can help make sure that non-homologous loci are not collapsed into one uh, locus. So on the bottom here, I'm showing two, two regions with the de novo clustering. We have a single copy region, and you can see that uh, it looks the same for both the de novo and the reference-based approach. However, with some repetitive regions, the de novo approach may collapse those down into a single locus, where in fact they are actually two different regions. So this reference-based approach will help make sure that you're calling homologous uh, sites um, instead of collapsing things down. And so I, met, I mentioned about what quality of reference do you need um, or will even help. And so with uh, working on a project with Adriana Hernandez, a grad student at Cornell in the spec lab, We've been working um, on assembling a genome for Calicordis venistis. Um, this species has a genome size of around five and a half gigabase, or gigabases, so it's about twice the human genome. And we've been using this for population uh, genetic analyses using a variety of different uh, options. Um, so along from left to right here are the different uses of the assembled genome. So we start off with the de novo approach again, so no genome necessary, no reference. We use just nanopore data and that reference, even though it had a fairly big um, N50 in comparison, we only assembled a very small portion of the five and a half gig genome. Using just the Illumina data, the assembly was much more fragmented, but there's more of the genome assembled. And then the hybrid assembly approach um, did put most of the genome together. Now those, those details are not super important, but I would like to highlight along the bottom here, are the number of both raw SNPs and, and high quality strict filtering SNPs that we recovered. So in the Novo approach, we had around 6,000 SNPs. When we filtered those out, we left around 2,000. And then as we progressed to better and better uh, draft genomes, but still not great draft genomes, we really increased our number of SNPs we could identify to when we had this kind of really kind of poor draft to over 15,000 SNPs, which was enough to do some initial uh, pop gen work. And so one key takeaway here is if you have a draft genome, even if it's not a great draft genome, it does not need to be chromosome level. It can definitely increase your ability to call SNPs. Now for many of these analyses you might be interested in, um, having an out group uh, is helpful, but maybe not necessary. It depends on what your goal, your questions are. So working with a project with uh, Lorena Villanueva looking at Washingtonia ferns, uh, we had a, a data set where we did both uh, de novo and reference-based SNP calling. And what we found is that with the de novo approach, because the outgroups were in a different genus, with the de novo approach, we were not able to retain any, any good high quality SNPs after filtering. However, with the reference approach, we were able to get about 8,000, 9,000 SNPs. Now our in-groups, we were able to call uh, quite a few um, SNPs with the de novo approach, around 20,000. Uh, with the reference-based approach, that did go down. High-quality SNPs did go down. However, we were able to incorporate that outgroup for some of these analyses. So that's one thing to keep in mind. Another concern is that using a reference may lead to some biases. So a paper from a few years ago by Trip et al. Um, looked at phylogenetic um, analyses and the proportion of unsupported nodes in their data set. And they found that with a reference-based approach, there were more nodes that were unsupported uh, compared to the two different de novo approaches that they employed. Again, it kind of depends on what your question is and what the sampling looks like. So if you should do a de novo or reference-based approach. So how do I get a reference? Uh, this is not the focus of this webinar, but I want to throw it in, throw it out here. So with uh, Susie Strickler and some, and some colleagues, we, we uh, produced a, a, a workshop uh, to going through genome assembly and annotation for non-model um, species. And one baseline, um, if you're just starting out with for, about a, for an organism with about a one gig genome, it would cost you around a little over 3,000 US dollars in order to, um, to generate a genome assembly that is uh, good enough to help you um, call SNPs. And so uh, again, I, all the, the references and information for this are found on the GitHub page, which we can also, uh, will be, we can provide a link to um, 
afterwards. And so going back to the rat seek, the reference-based approach. So for this, um, first we'll need to map our reads to the reference. And I have a slide next about what that actually means. And then there's another Perl script uh, embedded within stacks, uh, the refmap.perl, which all you need to do in this case is specify where your BAM files are and what the population map is. And they'll go through the, the entire workflow for you, which includes P stacks, C stacks, and S stacks. So just briefly, what these things are is that it'll take your line reads and it'll call SNPs at each locus. Then it makes a catalog and match loci based on genomic location and not just sequence similarity as was done uh, with the de novo approach. And so the code for that is again another one line of code. You'll call this rough map uh, Perl script. You'll give it a location of where your sorted BAM files are. So now it's not just the fast, the raw FASTQ data, but this, the mapping uh, results to your reference. Again, you'll specify the, specify the population map, and that could be either with uh, a priori populations or individuals. The output in this case could be just a rough wrapper, and then you have your additional arguments, in this case, number of threads. With this one as well, you'll have that population command that, is, that will be shown in the tutorial, but I'm not uh, showing it here, which will actually will then give you the BCF file uh, for downstream analyses. So I mentioned about mapping to the genome. And so this is often overlooked in a lot of studies, um, but there are many different options for mapping genomic data to a reference genome. And this includes B BWA MIM or the new version BWA MIM2, uh, Minimap2, Bowtie, et cetera. And so um, the proportion of reads that map to a genome is one factor, but it is not necessarily the most appropriate one to consider. So here's an example from a paper in 2014 looking at many different options where they look at the proportion of on-target hits, but then more importantly, the number of po uh, false positive hits. And so just being able to map your reads to a genome is important, but then it'd be mapped to the appropriate place. And so a lot of comparisons, and including this one here, BWA MIM often outperforms um, the other options in head-to-head -head comparisons. In this case, specifically, it had the lowest uh, rate of false positives. Now the output file from a mapping run is a SAM file. However, to save computational space and time, we will convert those from a SAM to a sort of uh, binary or BAM file, um, so it takes up less space. And so the code to run that, um, and BWA MIM in this case, which has been shown to be one of the best ones, so the first thing we need to do is we need to index our FASTA file, or a reference genome, to specify the genetic coordinates. And that command is just BWA, so the program, the function of index, and the assembly. Uh, throughout some of the remaining slides, I will have the Cyverse logo here. And so these are steps that can be, can be done on Cyverse, um, either with the, the uh, discovery environment or if you have a, a, an instance where you can use a command line, it can also be done there. So when we're mapping uh, the reads to a reference genome using BWA, we will we'll, um, use the read group information which allows us to easily identify what the samples are. So the read groups have five main pieces, all highlighted here in different colors, and they're placed in the script is below. Uh, so some of the most important ones are uh, the unique identifier for each of the samples and SM, the sample name. You will also include uh, the PL, which is the sequencing equipment, PU, which is the run identifier, and LB is the library count. For most of these projects, the PL, PU, and LB may be the exact same information for all your samples. However, you make, make it sure that that sample name is unique um, when you're running this. And so the code for this actual mapping part, again, using BWA MIM, here we're using eight threads. We're, we're uh, putting them in the read group information, which is this dash R, and we're going to specify what the different read group is. And this is a format that BWA needs and so you would, if you were to adjust this for your own data, you would just change uh, the part um, after the colon here to include what was the most appropriate. And then you'll tell it where your reference genome is. So this is in case genome assembly. If you have a forward and a reverse read for each sample, you include that. If you only had forward reads, you would just put the forward in there and leave out the second part. And then you'll tell what the output is. In this case, again, it's that SAM file uh, that we're making. And so we just covered the RADSeq, both de novo and reference-based. We're gonna move into HypeSeq and genome resequencing. 
which has a lot of the same uh, bioinformatic uh, steps as the RADSeq reference based. So for these, there's different programs though that we, you would use though for SNP calling, and there's no shortage of available programs out there or even recent comparisons between programs. Here's one highlighting uh, several different uh, options from a paper just this year. Some of the main differences that you'll see um, include maximum likelihood versus Bayesian framework or haplotype versus site-based. And this last one, what I'm referring to as site-based, is so in this example at the bottom, we have three SNPs, SNP1, SNP2, SNP3. The site-based approaches would take each site individually and call the SNP. However, the haplotype variety or versions would take the entire string, so in this case, the red string, the blue string, and the green string, and call the SNPs that way. So whatever is the most important for your project, um, it kind of depends on what your questions are, but there's different options available for sure to look into. So this is a big question that I often get is which SNP caller to use? And there's just not really a good uh, one solution for all this. The one thing I will say is that all SNP callers are not created equal. So in this recent publication, again, from Yao et al. 2020, they looked at these different options. They found that Freebase, GATK, and SAM tools in pileup had the lowest number of missed calls across all that were tested. However, Freebase, Varscan, and Vardict were most sensitive to unique calls. Now this can be problematic where a high sensitivity to unique calls could result in a higher false positive rate. When they tested true positives across all these different options, they found that SAM tools in pileup called 81% of all true positives, while GATK was second with 78%, and Freebase was just a little bit behind with 77.7. Some of this can be represented in this figure here. So along the x-axis, we have false po the, the false positive rate from zero to one, and the y-axis is the true positive from zero to one. And the key thing is that not all these programs respond in the same way. If you have a low false positive rate, GATK in a lot of times is your best option. However, if you have a very complex genome, maybe re very repetitive with a lot of false positives, other options um, have, have been shown to work better, such as impile up. Um, and Freebase. And so just kind of a summary of which to use, at least the ones that are often shown to be the best, in many comparisons is BWA MEM plus GATK. So this is your read mapper plus your SNP caller. But then for this particular one, which used uh, the large polypoid wheat genome, they found that the BWA MEM plus samples M polyp was recommended. So I can't tell you exactly one program that will work for every, every single situation, but some are definitely shown to be better than others. Other factors that were not shown here uh, that, are, that are important are the, the amount of time it takes to run through the analyses, the amount of uh, memory it takes to run, and so forth. So um, it should be some exploring for each of the projects that you may be interested in. So we're going to move forward with GATK, which is found to be one of the best options in a lot of data sets. And so there's a GATK best practices uh, workflow available online here but this is a summary of the workflow. So essentially what we have, you have your, your raw unmapped reads, you'll map those to the reference, again, whatever approach you want to, I would suggest, suggest BWA MEM. And that will, then you can sort that and convert that to a, a sorted BAM file. You will mark your duplicates. Um, you may not wanna do this if you're using RADSeq approaches, but anything um, that the library construction would have a PCR step, would highly suggest you marking those uh, to remove some of these false things that you may see. And now you have analysis ready BAM files. And so we can then, what we'll do is we'll call variants for each sample we have individually using haplotype caller. And this will call both SNPs and indels with local reassembly around those haplotypes. And then we, we may have uh, tens to hundreds of samples. We'll consolidate those all into one GBCF file and then we'll do joint genotyping across all those. So across our entire population or entire sampling, we can get a good idea of which sites are variant. Maybe some populations, some individuals have a variant site at some positions, but not others. So including this joint genotyping allows us to incorporate all that information. And then we'll have a raw SNP file in BCF format. And then we can filter and refine our steps if we need to. But then we'll have a BCF ready, um, analysis ready BCF file. And so the code for this, again, this is implemented, can be implemented in Cybers in the discovery environment, but the code that you do this if you're on the command line 
So first we would uh, prep our reference similar or a reference file similar to how we did with, with BWA MIM before the mapping. So we're going to do two parts here. The first is to create a sequence dictionary. Um, so this again using GATK, the function create sequence dictionary. We will tell it our reference genome assembly file, the FASTA file, and tell it an output file, which will be the, the prefix or genome assembly uh, dot, dot dictionary uh, for the output. And so that's going to tell you all your, your contigs and how, and how big they are to help coordinate um, the SNP calling. We will also index our, our genome assembly file. Um, this time you're using Santol's FADIX, um, the FADIX uh, command instead of what we used for BWA index previously. And then you'll have each of the samples that was then mapped to the genome. So this is all done on the reference assembly file that you have. Now for each of the samples you have a BAM file for, uh, you will need to make sure those are all indexed. Some of the more recent versions of GATK may do this for you. However, I'm including the command here uh, just in case they don't do it in your particular version. But you'll use SAM tools to index that particular BAM file. And then for each sample, we'll, uh, we'll do GATK haplotype caller. Again, we specify the reference assembly, the reference genome. Our input file is our, our, our duplicates marked uh, uh, BAM file. And then our output is a, G, a, a, G, a gbcf.gz file. And the emit uh, response uh, command we're using here is gbcf, which is saves in the amount of space that these output files need. So it will collapse down blocks um, that are, that are non-variant in your sample. So it's a good thing to use that to save uh, computational resources. So once we're through that step, technically now we have called SNPs on each sample. However, that's only the variance for that particular sample individually, and we're not including all the information from our sampling and our population. So we want a file that represents all the individuals and all the variants, because some individuals will have variants and others do not. So to do this, we need to combine the files and do the joint genotyping. So there's two commands for this. The first one is, uh, the GATK combined GBCFs. So for this, you're going to tell it the genome assembly uh, FASTA file. You'll give it a samples list of all the GBCF files that you have from haplotype caller. And then you'll tell it the output file. In this case, it's all samples combined .g, .bcf .g, however you can change this name to however you like. Once you have this combined file, now we'll do the joint genotyping with genotype GBCFs uh, through GATK. And so again, we'll tell the genome assembly file, uh, we'll tell it where the variant file is. So here's the command, the, the combined file, and we'll just tell it the output. So now this is gonna be your BCF file um, that we will use for, SNP, or for downstream analyses with the SNPs that you just called. So the resulting file, again, is that variant call format, BCF. If you're not familiar with this file, um, you can find more information here at the SAM Tools GitHub page. Um, but briefly what it is, is so you have a bunch of formatting along the top, formatting and info, information lines that tells you what was called, um, what they represent. You have a block that tells you what contigs that you have and how long they are. This comes from that create sequence dictionary. And then towards the bottom, you'll have it where each line is a variant. So you have your chromosome, your base pair position, the reference and alternative alleles and more information there. Then each column at this point is for each of your, your individuals that you included. Again, check out the SAM tools page to learn more about how these different pieces are actually coded and represented in this file. And so I've given up to this point all the commands that you would use in the command line. However, if you're not familiar with the command line or not comfortable with it, within Cyverse, using the discovery environment, you can do a point and click option uh, that will run through all these steps for you. Um, but you have to do this each individually. So again, what we'll do is we'll start off, we'll index our reference sample file with BWA index. We'll map our individual reads using BWA mem. We'll then convert this from SAM to assorted BAM. With it going back to our reference file, we'll create the sequence dictionary. We will index using SAM tools. Then for the created BAMs that we, when we mapped our reads to, we will call, we'll mark duplicates. In this case, we'll add the read groups here 
Whereas in the command line, I did that with BWA, which I find is a bit easier, but you can also do this in, in this step um, in the command line as well. We'll add our read groups, and then we'll make sure that BAM file is indexed. Now we'll go through the actual GATK steps, where we'll do a haplotype caller, we will combine the GVCFs, and then here at the end, we'll G do the joint genotyping. So at the end, you are left with the VCF file. I will say that with discovery environment, you do have limited resources, about eight CPUs and 16 gigs of RAM um, per individual. So this is, enough this is enough horsepower to run this test data set, but if you had a big data set with say hundreds of samples and a large genome, you may not be able to do this here. And so uh, you can request other resources from Cybers um, to make it possible to run this, but you'd have to probably go to the command line to do that. I want to bring up a few issues with GATK. Um, so this program uh, can be very difficult to learn at first. Uh, I've had a lot of trouble with it in different times, uh, but I've been using it the last several years. However, there is an extensive and active discussion board online and many tutorials that go more in depth than some of the things that we're able to talk about today. The scalability could be another, op another difficulty depending on the, the type of the project where uh, using more threads or processors doesn't always speed up your analyses. So here's an example um, with the wall time, the amount of minutes it takes to each run, and eventually, once you get to a little bit about 10 threads, adding more threads doesn't really help. In fact, it may uh, inhibit the run a little bit. One last thing I do want to mention about uh, potential problems with GTK is that version issues are real. So there are often updates about this program, and when they come out, the updates, some of the commands may change or may not work entirely the same way, and they may not be documented very well. So if, you're, if it's been a while since you used GATK and you're using a different version now, I would highly suggest going back to the, to the main GATK website and looking at their current tutorials and their current, uh, their current um, suggestions on what works. Because I have uh, had many problems with different versions, some commands not working at all. So we have our BCF fob. We've called our SNPs but we're not quite ready to get into some of those initial analyses that I showed at the very beginning of this webinar. The next thing we need to do is filter the data. And there's some different, there's some primary options you can do, mainly VCF tools or BCF tools. You can also use some GATK methods um, that has a link here, but I personally have not used this very much in my research um, uh, projects. I will say that VCF tools, it is very easy to implement and is not picky at all about spec uh, specific formatting of your files. It does have limited options, but it has very, a very clear user manual on how to implement those options. Uh, it can be slow on large data sets, and by large data sets, I'm talking about hundreds of taxa and millions of SNPs. And one very important piece, it cannot handle polyploid data. So if you're working on polyploids, uh, do not try to use VCF tools, it will, it will not work. BCF tools, on the other hand, um, it is a bit harder to implement for basic filtering, but if you can figure that out, it is much more powerful. It is much faster with large data sets and it can handle polyploid data. So if that's the kind of data you have, definitely go with BCF tools. It is actively supported and distributed alongside, alongside SAM tools. Now I'm talking about filtering. What am I talking about? So let's say we have our initial of raw data set. So each column here is a SNP and each rows are samples. Now when we're looking at it, we see that most of these may be fine. However, with, with certain criteria, we might find that uh, some alleles or some sites we don't want, such as multi-allelic sites. So this column here has the T, the A, and the C. We don't want biallelic sites, we want to remove this. And we also might institute other uh, minimum filtering requirements, such as minimum, uh, minor low frequency, uh, read quality, read depth, or so forth. And so when we go through and filter those, filter it, some sites, such as those two that were color coded above, will be completely removed from the data set. And that's okay. We want to make sure we are left with high quality SNPs that we're very confident in for our downstream analyses. And so here's the example for VCF tools code, which is the, which was I, what I use for most of my smaller projects. And so let's say you wanted to keep uh, in your data set, only sites that were biallelic had at, at most 50% missing data, read depth between 30 or between three and 30 X coverage to be accurate in whether it's a homozygote or heterozygote. 
and a minor allele frequency of at least 5%. Here's the command that you would do. Now this is maybe not, and so before I say that, so this is the command. So you're calling the program, VCF tools, you'll tell it the, the input file. In this case, it's a VCF file. And then here are the specific pieces of what I've mentioned above. So our max missing 50%, a minimum, of, a minimum and a maximum of two alleles, our depth between three and 30, and our minor allele frequency. It is very, very important if you do this to make sure you incorporate this recode and recode all info to in order to get it to write uh, the VCF file the output appropriately, and then you'll tell it a, a prefix um, that you'll use. Now this example may work as an initial filtering pass for some of your projects, However, it's not necessarily the, the standard you want to use for every single thing. There is a, a big trade-off between um, percent missing data and the number of individuals kept. So in this example up on the top right, the red line is the individuals and the black line is SNPs. And as we go from zero, no missing data to, or all missing data to no missing data, you can see that at some point we hit this trade-off where we are removing SNPs, but we are keeping more individuals. And so, you may want to play around with your data sets in order to figure out where that good spot is for your particular project. And it may change from project to project. Also within VCF tools, it is very easy to report some of the, the information that you may want to know about your SNP calling, such as read depth per individual, percent missing data, and header zygous values. And so here's some of those, those one line code that you'll use for that. And just the last few slides here, I want to say that, so we have a, I have a tutorial I'll put up on GitHub, and here's a link that you can have access to. You can walk through a lot of these steps on your own. It incorporates publicly available data with a high quality genome and some, rat, some RNA-seq data in this case from different organs from Utricularia Gibba. It is a small data set, and it can run on your local machine. I also have examples for both the command line and the discovery environment if you want to try this out. And we have SNP calling using both Stacks and GATK with a little bit of filtering and PCA at the end for your data set. A couple of take home messages uh, for this. Every project may demand a modified SNP calling approach. Um, it's good to, to play around with what your particular data set or what works best for your particular data set. Things that might influence this or influence your methods, maybe if you have a large genome if it's polyploid, availability, and quality of a reference genome. In some ways, I will say filtering, SNP filtering is kind of like an art uh, because it will change based on your different projects. But it's important to explore what happens in your particular project as you adjust parameters such as quality, missingness, and so forth. Hopefully all of this and the available uh, tutorials on GitHub is a good start on your SNP calling journey but there are definitely many intricacies through all these programs that I wasn't really able to cover um, that you'll find along the way, but this should be a good start at least um, to get going. And with that, we'd like to thank Cybers and importantly, the National Science Foundation for supporting Cybers. Thank you all for coming and thank you for all the, the folks at Cybers who helped uh, make this possible. And if there's time for any questions, I'll be happy to take those. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jacob. That's great very thorough and i think um you definitely hit the the mark when saying that it is an art and you've shared a lot of your artistry with us things like your helpful hints uh there is a question um it says can gatk pipeline be used for snp analyses with a group of loci for example all ca zymes 2000 loci instead of for an entire genome Yes, it can be. Um, if you had a reference, something to map your, your, your data to, your RATSEQ data to, it can be used. Um, if you have no reference, then it cannot. You want to use a de novo approach method. But you can definitely give it a shot. For a lot of the RATSEQ uh, approaches, they, you'll see other programs not, with not GATK being used. But you can definitely give it a shot. But it may not be the best. Got it. OK. Uh, another question, I'm new to SNP calling and have a very naive question. In the prokaryotic world, would it be theoretically correct to apply these SNP calling procedures treating different strains as if they were different individuals? So I'm not uh, entirely certain about the prokaryotic, but I would believe you would, I would believe you want to keep the strains different as different individuals. Whatever a 
genetic unit would be that you were sequencing, um, if you combine them together, you might have the problem of having multi allelic sites then. And so depending on how you filter your SNPs, that might cause problems. But my initial thought would be, yes, keep the strains as different individuals. But it might be worth exploring to see how that actually changes your results. Okay. Next question. Would you comment on using related species genomes for variant calling? It, it does work. So the, the example with the, the Washingtonian ferns that I showed, um, so we did not have a reference genome uh, in Washingtonia. Uh, the closest one was the date palm, which is a, a, a little bit away. So if you use a more distantly related uh, genome, the number of SNPs that you find will probably go down because of the ability to map the reads appropriately. Um, but as long as you've had something to map to, it should be no problem. Okay. Uh, for filtering, would you recommend Plink besides the ones you presented here? Yes, I would. And so um, I use Plink, and I didn't include it here, but in the tutorial walkthrough on GitHub, I use Plink for uh, pruning for linkage disequilibrium. Um, but you can also use it for other filtering. Um, I honestly find VCF tools to be one of the most straightforward and the easiest to use. Um, but Plink is, is definitely in my arsenal of when I prepare my data for downstream analyses, for sure. Okay. How much is it accurate to use a reference-based SNP calling as reference genome may be biased towards particular population? Definitely. It might be. So I think it depends on this case of what your uh, sampling looks like. If it's population, species level, um, if you have some, some individuals that are more distant related phylogenetically, uh, yes, they will be missed. Um, however, including those in the novo uh, method will probably miss those entirely. Um, so it's a trade-off of there is some bias, yes, but if you want to include those for some things, I think the, the reference-based approach would be your best option. If you had multiple references to, to, uh, to try from from different species or different uh, genera, it might be worth uh, trying to run through a few samples of SNP calling, um, not your entire data set, but a small data set to see how your outputs would change. Um, but I can't tell you for sure what is always the best approach. <laughs> Why can't you? No, I'm teasing. Okay. Can BWA MEM be used for alignment divergence sequence? If, if so, are there any standard parameters? So the, a lot of the uh, comparisons have the BWA MEM using just default parameters. But yes, you can, you can definitely uh, change those to allow for more divergence mapping. Um, but I would probably suggest starting out with the default parameters and see what your, uh, your percentage of map reads are. If you're very low, maybe allow for more mismatches to try to bump that up. However, the more mismatches you have, the more possibility you have for false positives, which would not be good for your analyses. Okay. Um, there are several more questions. I'm going to read all of them until we run out of time, which is in about six more minutes. For those who want to know whether we are going to make this recording available or Jason slides, yes, yes, yes. The uh, website, our website, cyverse.org, will have them. We also post to our YouTube channel. So let's continue on with the questions. Um, uh, let's see, for de novo rad seq data, a colleague suggested assembling a pseudo genome from the rad tags, then mapping back to that. How would you go about creating the quote pseudo genome? Yes, I've, I've done this before actually in a few projects. Um, you could do this in stacks where you could export the, uh, the fastest sequences for each rad locus. And then you, you could then have each, each contig would be a locus and then you could just map your reads back to that. Um, I forget what the particular output is with uh, the flag for that is in stacks, but I would run through the, the de novo uh, pipeline first, get those and then export that and then map your reads back to that um, with using BWA MIM or something similar. Okay. Have you ever used a transcriptome as a reference? Uh, yes, you can do that. Uh, you're missing, obviously you're missing non-coding regions. Um, and so, Anything really that can be used, um, as long as it's in the FASTA format, you can use it. Um, you just won't be able to call quite as many SNPs. So I think you, should, you could definitely try it. Okay. 
someone's working with an orphan crop for which there is no reference genome, or it's not yet available, uh, can they use one of these tools for SNP calling? Yes, uh, if you, you can use, even if it's a, a somewhat distantly related species, you can definitely do it. Um, and most of, these things, most of these analysis can be done um, within a single species, but the genome you use does not have to be the same genome. As long as it's something you can map to, um, that is totally fine. Right, okay. Um, I want to make GATK haplotype collar more efficient by running it by chromosome instead of on the whole yes. genome. In that case, do I need to run combined GVCF twice, like for combining chromosomes in one sample first, followed by combining samples? Yes, you would. So um, in the combined GV GVCF function, you can specify your samples and you can also specify your intervals. And so when I, when I do this, I run it for each chromosome, specify the, inter the interval, say chromosome one, chromosome two, chromosome three, with all the individuals. And so then if I have seven chromosomes, I would run this uh, iteratively seven times. Um, but you can also do multiple chromosomes um, in, a, in any interval. You can split those up. That's kind of up to you. But each interval, you should, um, you'd probably want to run a different instance of combined, combined GVCF uh, for that interval set and then run the joint genotyping on whatever your combined file is. Okay. Uh, could I use SNPs for, or how could I use SNPs for diversity within a single species? Um, <laughs> I mean, that's kind of more the downstream analyses that we didn't like to talk about, but you could look at uh, unique versus shared alleles. Um, there's some options for uh, looking at migration patterns. Um, you know, ancestor versus derived alleles, depending on what data set you have. Um, it is possible, uh, you know, some of like the structure analysis that I, I hinted at the very beginning, but maybe do some of this as well. But I think that's kind of more topics for a, another webinar potentially. Yeah, I think there's so much interest here, uh, Jacob. We, we, we have to bring you back. Uh, <laughs> a couple more. Uh, thanks for answering these. I know this is like firing <laughs> at you, but in the BWE mem, Sam Tools M pileup SNP calling pipeline, um, this person faces a particular problem with generating the BCF file due to BCF tools not being able to parse the header. It is, is it possible to skip that step and call SNPs from the BAM file directly? If not, do you have an example of a command line that works? So it sounds like it sounds like there's an issue in the SAM tools and polyp commands. I don't know if you've tried using a new version of, of Impala. I know there was a recent SAM tools had version 1.9 come out. Uh, I think, I think that is a problem. Maybe you have to redo the SNP calling. I'm not sure. With BCF tools, you need to have that either BCF or BCF.gz file. The GZ in this case is just the gzipped um, or bgzipped actually in this case to make it smaller but the same information is all there. Um, but I would maybe look at the, uh, go back to the SNP column, as long as there's a problem there, not necessarily in the filtering step. Okay. If doing GBS with a species that has no published genome, what's the best method to use for partial sequencing from other studies um, as a reference? Sorry. I mean, if you, you could, you could, I mean, if you had uh, Lumina data or something else, you could do a quick a genome assembly um, following some of those steps I, I laid out in the genome assembly uh, tutorial that's also linked on GitHub. It doesn't have to be a great quality, just something there to, uh, some contigs there to map your reads to. Um, the longer the contig, the, the better the mapping will be, and the better you'll be calling SNPs. Um, but if, you, if, the novel, if the de novo aspect doesn't work, um, which I would probably start trying that first, but if you have samples that are very divergent, um, just try to find something that is kind of shared uh, sequencing wise. You could also use um, other types of sequencing data. If you have some Sanger data and other things, you can, you can definitely map to that, but again, this would be a lower output total. So it might be worth trying. Okay. I want to make GATK haplotype color more efficient by running it by chromosome instead of on the whole genome. Did I read that one already? Yeah, we covered that one. Okay, I'm sorry. I'm getting lost in the questions. Um, can I use stacks for SNP calling through populations? Is that a good tool? So populations is, is, the, is the, final, the final command in the stacks pipeline, both the de novo and reference. So the examples I showed here lead up to that populations uh, command. If you look in the walkthrough on GitHub, you'll see that 
how that's incorporated. So basically for populations, you'll, you, it's expected you've already ran the rest of the pipeline. You tell it the folder where the information is for each of your individuals. And from there, it will create your BCF file that you can use for uh, downstream filtering analyses what's, and, and whatnot. Okay. I think that's all we have time for. So Jacob, my thanks so much to you. Thank you for sharing your knowledge and the helpful hints and taking questions rapid fire. Please join us everybody in two weeks. Our next webinar is on using I commands for great, greatest flexibility and control in moving your data in Cyverse to be presented by Cyverse's co-PI, Eric Lyons. Until then, stay healthy. We'll see you in two weeks. And yes, you all will be getting the link to uh, this video recording as we load it onto YouTube. You also please go uh, find more information on our website, our webinar page, and we'll load up Jason's slides and uh, a link again to this video recording. Thanks everyone. See you in a couple weeks. Thank you all Thank for you. showing up. Thank you, Jacob.